full of compassion, slow to anger, and full of kindness and truth. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaid. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame. Because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Our next reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Word of God, word of life. Please stand for the reading of the gospel as you are able. Hallelujah, let you hear. the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has gathered them. But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time, all the reapers collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you have ever uh, needed to read a map? Just raise your hand. Okay, almost, almost all of you have done that before. Yeah, okay. Well, a week ago, uh, my two boys, Jacob and Eric, 25 and 21, and I returned from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, where we had spent almost a week in... Uh, canoeing um, and portaging. And in this kind of a wilderness adventure, which some of you have perhaps done, you have to depend on your own planning, your own wits, your own skills, or lack thereof. And of course, the grace of God helps as well. When, you're, when we were out there, and when you're out on a trip like that, uh, you also need a good compass and a good map, a reliable map, one that you can trust. Um, reading a map, like in a wilderness setting like that, is really turned around and find the next portage or go in circles for a long time. Now, the first lake we were on, Seagull Lake. I'd never been on it before. And it has dozens of islands. And in the distance, those islands kind of blend into the shoreline. And you can't make them out. It's just one kind of continuous shoreline. So as you go along and chart your course, you have to stop occasionally and maybe recalculate a little bit or recalibrate um, which way you're going. And then you're looking at the landmarks along the way. Um, the map tells the truth, and the compass tells the truth. So if you trust your compass and your map and read the land around you carefully, you're going to be fine. Um, if you don't carefully follow the map, you can pretty quickly tracked. So you need to keep an eye. When I'm doing the map reading, uh, I'm really looking at it carefully, uh, regularly. Sometimes it's not very clear which way to go. A little bit like life. Sometimes we may not be clear about the direction to travel. As we're going through a pandemic, confused about what's the best thing to do in the midst of this time. Um, in traveling in the wilderness, there may be fog up ahead or all those islands, and you have to sort through all of that. One day, while we were traveling, I, on the way back to our starting point, I asked my son, say, uh, to try reading the map and orient us to the next. And interestingly, the younger jumped at the chance, not the older boy, but Eric. And um, so he studied the map before we took off. And there were a bunch of islands ahead. And it wasn't going to be easy to find the portage. So I wondered to myself, I didn't have, he had the map, but I kind of knew about where to go. Um, I wondered if he could make it. And so uh, we took off, and I followed, and he was charting. Well, then about midway through, we got up by the islands, and he had to stop and study the map. And he, he like pointed his paddle saying, Dad, is it this way? I didn't, I didn't do a thing. <laughs> I decided this is his opportunity to either fail or succeed in this uh, and, you know, and to take the risk. So he finally took off again after studying the map, and lo and behold, we got to the portage. <laughs> and I was pretty, uh, pretty proud of him that he was able to navigate that. Um, 
proud of himself, too, as he raised his paddle like he'd won a race or something. So he trusted the map. He had to trust his interpretation of the surroundings and of the map. And um, it showed him the way, showed us the way to our next destination, our next point, which was the portage. A portage, by the way, if you don't know, is a path between the lakes or a lake and a stream that you hike with your material over, your, your packs and so on. I think most of you know that. But So I want to suggest today that God's word is much like... in that when we read it and study it and look out at our surroundings of life, it can orient us in this world and in this life. And if 